Welcome to Pin and Reel, where we discuss comic books, movies, books, and more. I'm your host, Uncle Joel. Let's get into it. Star Wars needs no introduction. I think it's safe to say that just about everybody knows at least something about Star Wars. Even those who have no interest in Star Wars can identify Darth Vader and R2-D2, lightsabers, and probably even some of the theme music. But what I feel a lot of people might not know is the origins of Star Wars. And that's where we're going to be going today. We're going to be taking a look at some of the early years of Star Wars, prior to the first movie ever being released. And we're going to be doing so by discussing the comic book adaptation of George Lucas's original Star Wars script. Now this script is significantly different from the Star Wars that we all know and love. It has a lot of the same elements, but it's very evident that there were a number of things that were shifted around and characters that were blended together, some ideas that were scrapped, and some that were just redone and rejuvenated. And as a whole, it winds up being this strangely familiar product, and yet very different and somewhat alien. Now an important thing to note about this project is that some of the artwork is based off of descriptions within the script. Some of it is based off of early sketches, and some of it was created entirely wholesale for this comic. And the artists went for a very interesting blend, where they took some inspiration from the Star Wars products that we already got, as well as inspiration from what inspired Lucas originally, from stories such as Flash Gordon. And so the things that you see here will in some ways be very familiar, but in other ways very foreign. For instance, the primary antagonist here is Darth Vader. Only, this isn't the Darth Vader that we know. He is a general of the Empire, but that's pretty much all he is. He's not a Sith, he doesn't carry a lightsaber, he's not partially robotic, he doesn't have the mask. In fact, the only distinguishing marks about him are he has a couple of scars around his face, and he has one red eye. So it appears as though he had been cut across the face with a lightsaber. But that's just a guess. It's never really explained within the story how he got the scar or how he lost the eye. And then alongside Darth Vader, they bring in a Sith Knight called Prince Valorum. And it's fairly evident that from those two characters, we got them combined to get the Darth Vader that we know. As well as elements from another character, Kane Starkiller. Now that name is not familiar to any of the movies. But Kane Starkiller is the father of Anakin Starkiller. And Kane Starkiller is primarily robotic. So just as Darth Vader in the proper continuity is primarily robot after having lost most of his humanity, so is Kane Starkiller. And so it's elements from these three different characters that have been combined in order to create the Darth Vader that we know. And so Kane Starkiller is a Jedi. But the thing is, the Jedi are not really what we know them to be. Here, called the Jedi Bendu, or Jedi for short, the Jedi are pretty much just skilled warriors. Like most things in this script, we're not given a lot of context or a lot of background explanation. We just know the Jedi Bendu have been around for over a hundred thousand years, and they are these great warriors. Now, at this point, the Jedi Bendu are mostly extinct, and believed to be extinct. But pretty much all we see of them w within this comic, and thus within this script, is they're skilled warriors. And in fact, they're quite aggressive at that. So there's no real hints of using the Force or having any real special abilities whatsoever, other than they know how to fight with a lightsaber, which Quick side note, they're not the only ones who have lightsabers. Stormtroopers have lightsabers, as well as Han Solo has a lightsaber. And so we get a very different picture of what a Jedi is. And speaking of the Force, it really isn't present here pretty much at all. There is a number of times where characters say, May the Force of others be with you. And a few variations of that. But that's pretty much it. So if Lucas had the Force in mind to be anything more than just a greeting and a cultural thing, if it was actually going to be 
a connection with the universe or or any source of any sort of powers then that is not evident within this script we have things like alderaan being the capital of the empire instead of coruscant but alderaan looks very similar to coruscant and the emperor isn't really this wizened jedi figure this sith figure he's just a politician and in fact he has a very small role in the story Naturally, there's an empire, so there has to be an emperor, but pretty much he dictates to Darth Vader and a, another character is, uh, who he has appointed the governor of the sector that they are trying to take over. And after a brief speech, he's not really seen from him again. And we do get introduced to General Luke Skywalker, who is in his 60s, and here within this book is modeled after George Lucas. And Luke Skywalker winds up taking Anakin Starkiller on as his apprentice. We get a couple more traveling companions within Klieg Whitson and Han Solo. And I feel that those two characters were probably combined to create the Han Solo that we know. But the Han Solo here in the original script describes him as a giant green monster. And based off of that description and an early sketch, the Han Solo that we see within this book looks more like Swamp Thing. I do not know what that is, sir. We also get Princess Leia here, but she is legitimately a daughter of a king and queen. And I think they were the king and queen of the Aquilae system, which is what the Empire is attacking and trying to take over. And so Princess Leia is the princess of the Aquilae system, but she isn't on her own. She has two younger siblings who are twins, one male, one female. And those twins are named Biggs and Wendy. And so again, we're seeing hints of what the story would eventually become of these male and female twins that would be rolled into Luke and Leia, as well as the name Biggs, which is going to be recycled and reused for another character. And that's done quite a bit here. There's a lot of name shuffling, even in first names and last names. So for instance, there's also a character of Bale and Tilly's, in which case those names are split into Wedge and Tilly's and Bale Organa. Likewise, there are a couple of rebel pilots, one that goes by the name of Mace, which is clearly a precursor to Mace Windu, and another that goes by the name Chewie, which is not Chewbacca. It's not a nickname for Chewbacca. It has nothing to do with Chewbacca. It is a completely separate character, just named Chewie. We do get the droids, which are more or less the same. C-3PO is pretty much the same, has a slightly different design, but I think that was simply to set it apart from the canon material. And R2-D2 has these strange little arms coming out of his head, which I don't know if that is intended to differentiate from the canon material or if that was in the original script. Either way, it's here in the comic book. And one significant change that I found very interesting is that there are no Imperial Walkers. There are no AT-ATs, there are no ATSTs. What they had were hover tanks. And this is a concept that was reused in the prequel trilogy with the Trade Federation, but it was present here in the original script and used in places where we would see Imperial Walkers in the movies. For instance, towards the end of the story, the heroes wind up in a massive forest on some foreign planet where they crash landed. The planet's never really named, but this is the planet where they stumble across Wookiees. And this entire sequence is pretty much stripped straight out of Return of the Jedi, where the Ewoks are. It's fairly common knowledge that the Ewoks were originally intended to be Wookiees, but that wasn't just the original plan for Return of the Jedi, that was the original plan for the original Star Wars movie. Only if you think the Ewoks are goofy, what Lucas originally did with the Wookiees was even more goofy. Because, yes, they do fight these hover tanks and this Imperial army with booby traps just like the Ewoks did. But even beyond that, these are a native people who have never left the planet and are unfamiliar with technology and they don't speak English. At least, that's how everything appears and how it seems to be presented. But General Skywalker winds up teaching these Wookiees how to be fighter pilots, and he appears to do so in a very short amount of time. At least the way that it is presented here, it doesn't seem like it could be more than a couple of days. And to make matters worse, the Wookiees paint war paint on all of their starships. 
and it all just comes across like very goofy. Now, this is where we get the introduction of Chewbacca. Anakin winds up separated from the rest of the group, and he stumbles upon a Wookiee tribe. And he gets into combat with one of their largest Wookiees, and he winds up winning. And the Wookiees, in turn, revere him as a god, just as C-3PO does. But I think it works better with C-3PO, because he looks like a golden idol, as opposed to Anakin here, who just is this alien creature who happens to be a better fighter. So Chewbacca, just a random Wookiee there, not the one that Anakin actually fought and defeated, just some random Wookiee. Attaches himself to Anakin, and Anakin can't communicate with him, but the rest of the group shows up, and Han Solo somehow knows how to speak to the Wookiees. So he communicates with them, learns his name, it's Chewbacca, and everybody moves on. Most of the central conflict does involve the Death Star, but I don't recall it being named, so it's just this unnamed giant massive space base. And not only is it unnamed, but it doesn't have planet killing capabilities. Literally all it is, is this giant round war base that flies through space. You know, this could essentially function as a star destroyer, it just happens to be shaped like a planet. However, the, the heroes do wind up on the Death Star, and they do get into some somewhat familiar territory with, with a couple of them falling down into a trash compactor, and the walls start to close in on them, threatening to crush them. Only this time, the walls stop because one of the Wookiees destroyed the power base and shut down power to the entire Death Star. And yet, somehow, the lights are still on, but whatever. Logic's not necessary here. And the story does end similar to what we got in the original trilogy. They wind up blowing up the Death Star, and everybody celebrates this massive victory. We get a medal awarding ceremony, and then there is a brief epilogue text, similar to the opening text, that says that the story will be continued in Saga of the Ofuchi. Ofuchi. I'm not really sure how to pronounce that. So overall, there are a lot of things that are similar, and it's clear that a number of things have been shuffled around in order to make them the way that we know them now. But it's quite clear to me with this original script that Lucas didn't have a strong grasp of storytelling. He had a lot of interesting ideas and concepts here, but the story was not necessarily the best. See, there are a lot of things that are pretty inexplicable. For instance, R2-D2 and C-3PO were originally Imperial droids that were on the Death Star. And when the Death Star is getting attacked early in the movie, the droids try to escape the destruction, and they get into a life pod, and they wind up on this desert planet where the heroes find them, and they decide to switch sides... because... Like, there really isn't much of an explanation given other than the fact that R2-D2 says that he thinks that they will be seen as deserters for having fled. He doesn't explain that that's why they're switching sides, he just says that at one point. Which, quick side note, R2-D2 speaks plainly and clearly here. But aside from them possibly switching sides because they assume that the Empire will just assume that they were deserters, there's not really any explanation given for why they all of a sudden are working with the Rebels. Likewise, Towards the end of the story, Anakin Starkiller winds up in a fight with the Sith Lord Prince Valorum. Only before they actually start exchanging blows, Prince Valorum betrays the stormtroopers that are around them and says, hey, let's fight together and make a stand against tyranny. But there's no explanation for this complete character change and why a Sith Knight is teaming up with a Jedi and why this seemingly evil person has suddenly betrayed the Empire and is now working with the Rebels. It comes completely out of nowhere, with no explanation whatsoever, and it happens just because. Or consider the fact that Luke and Leia wind up falling in love with one another pretty much immediately. Not just like, hey, you're hot, I'm attracted to you, or I'm, I'm saving your life and so now you're flattered and you're interested in me. No, they actually say flat out, I love you, and I am in love with you. And so it goes from nothing to full-on love in literally no time flat. 
Like the story progression within this script doesn't really give much evidence of the passage of time. And so it comes across as if the entire story is taking place in just a couple of days, if that. So for them to meet and then be in love with one another in such a short time is absolutely ridiculous. And that's the way that just so much of the script plays out. It jumps from one idea to the next without much consideration or setup. It's just, hey, here's a cool idea, here's a cool idea, here's a cool idea, here's a cool idea. Okay, story's over. And it follows a number of cliches, such as the noble knight who is saving the princess, and they fall in love and live happily ever after, and the plucky band of rebels who stand up to fight the empire. And in so many ways, it's just a very uninspired script, and worse, very poorly written and executed. You know, a lot of the dialogue is very stilted. Just overall, I really understand why this script had to be reworked so much. I genuinely think that if this was the script that they used to make the movie, that the movie would not have been anywhere near as successful as it was. And we probably would not have the Star Wars franchise with us today. Which is probably the main thing that I find so interesting about this book. And thus about the original script. It is pretty much universally agreed that the original trilogy are the best Star Wars movies. And people debate about the other ones. Some people love the prequel movies. Others, like myself, are highly critical of them. But in my perception, I feel like the problem with the prequel movies is that Lucas didn't have other people he was working with. And with the original trilogy, he had people helping correct his script, and he had help from Spielberg with directing. And it was very much a group effort, which I think is probably what helped make them so strong. Whereas the prequels, he insisted on doing everything himself. So whereas the weaknesses that were in this original script were ironed out in the actual movies that were released in the original trilogy, for the prequel trilogy, Lucas attempted to do the scripts on his own and did not have the same kind of help that he had in the original trilogy. So I feel like this comic and this original script helps highlight my notion that Lucas is great with ideas and he's really good if he has other people helping him flesh out those ideas and really work with him to hone what he is trying to create. Now I'm really happy that I read this comic. I enjoyed it and I got a lot out of it, but I only did so because I can compare it to the movies. On its own merits, I think this is a bad script, it's a bad story, and the ideas are poorly utilized. Now, this is a book that, in my eyes, only has merits as part of the legacy of the Star Wars that we have today. So if you're interested in seeing for yourself what Star Wars might have been, I recommend checking it out. But if you're looking for a good story, good characters, and a good world, or anything familiar, then you want to give this one a pass. Be sure to help me out by hitting like and subscribe. Leave a comment to let me know your thoughts. And until next time, this is Uncle Joel saying, stay tangible. <laughs>